right, welcome, CS235. This is lecture six. Let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. Okay, well, we're missing a good proportion of the class, but that's okay. I'll just go ahead and give out the pre-sanded shafts right now. <laughs> <laughs> They're all screwed. So uh, today's lecture is going to be on friction drives. Differentials, the combination thereof, and then flexures. But just real quick, we're having uh, issues with our laser cutter. So uh, as such, I've extended the homework until Friday at 5. I believe that will be more than sufficient. I think I have parts for everyone. If it's not, I'll extend it again. It will be less likely. It will be very unlikely for that to happen. So Friday at 5 is the drop dead for uh, homework 1. And we'll be handing out the parts for those who don't have it in office hours tonight, 7 o'clock until the wee hours of the morning. Frank Sinatra will be there as well. Lab 2 will hopefully go out Monday if I can laser cut it. And then uh, a few of you still owe me checks for the lab fee and safety forms for Clark. If that's you, uh, please give them to me after class. Okay, so let's talk about friction drives. Uh, I guess... The first thing we need is everyone needs to file up and grab yourself two rollerblade wheels and one box of your favorite flavor of Tic Tacs. Can we eat them? Sure, you may eat them. Are they for okay. eating? Or are they for, for the treasure lies not in the Tic Tac, but in the box. I can't help but take that personal. And I'm, I'm guessing that the orange ones will go first. Oh, they're so gross. What do you mean they're gross? Orange Tic Tacs are delicious. It's the only thing better than chewing on Silly Putty. <laughs> Please don't break a tooth. I'm not responsible for that. <laughs> Two rollerblades, one box of Tic Tacs. And uh, I will let you know if any of you have to purchase things using research funds that when you buy Tic Tacs using a uh, lab's research P card, they make you write an explanation email for why you bought like 90 packs of Tic Tacs. And what was yours? Using them for the treasure Science. within. All right, does, it, does everyone have exactly two roller blades and one box of Tic Tacs? Okay, At the end of lecture, you may keep the Tic Tacs. My guess is there'll be nothing to keep by then. I need these roller blades back. Each of them, please, because I only have enough for those enrolled in the class. And again, if you don't bring them back, then someone won't be doing the lab. Uh huh. For the parts and components of lab one, do uh -huh. you have to keep them, or do you have to take them apart for lab two? You only have to take apart probably two axes, maybe only one. Remember those little bearings that I gave you um, in in class? You can use those for lab lab one. Okay. Two of these, one box of Tic Tacs. Office hours tonight at seven. I'll be 3D printing uh, most of the gears starting tonight, overnight, and then I'll hand them out after tonight. So friction drives are near and dear to my heart. They're one of my favorite mechanical transmissions. And I'm hoping after this, after today and lab two, they will be one of your favorites. So go ahead and take your rolling blade wheels and um, put them together and apply some force. And notice that they, do, they, uh, they don't slip very much. The harder you press, the uh, more force it takes for them to slip. And you can then take, uh, if you have a desk, you can put it on your desk and press and kind of drag. Okay. So a friction drive is a geared transmission with no teeth. They have to be in contact just like gears. You can't have them spread apart like belts. But there's no teeth. And so rather than having positive engagement of the teeth for higher, higher than one coefficient, you have, um, you're just pressing them together really hard. Go ahead and get two roll blade wheels and one box of Tic Tacs. And all the math works exactly the same. So we have one wheel and a second wheel. We spin this one and then this reverses direction. That's it. I wish I had more to tell you, but after you know how gears work, 
and you have two roller blade wheels in your hands, that's really what it is. After that, we can talk about pros and cons, but that's what a friction drive is. So, um, as you uh, correctly deduced from their name, they work on friction. What is mu? Okay, and it's a parameter of what? No. Try again. Nope. Add an S to your answer. It's a parameter of materials, pairs. These don't exist in a vacuum by themselves. This does not have a coefficient of friction. This on this has a coefficient of friction. This on this has a coefficient of friction. This on this covered in butter has a different coefficient of friction. Um, this is a parameter of material pairs. And that is very important, and it's also an excellent Qualls question. This is the normal force. So in our example here, this is how hard we're squishing them together with our hands. And this is our friction force. There you go. And you guys know about static and kinetic. and. Um, so the nice thing about friction wheels Friction drives are a couple things. One is they're mechanically safe in that if I take two of these wheels versus two gears and I just apply too much torque, the gears will rip all the teeth off. These will just slip. They're probably not even going to lose any material. I mean, the nice, if one of these was steel and one of these was rubber and you squish the hell out of them and you slipped, you might lose a tiny bit of material at a high speed, but, but re in reality that, that just doesn't happen. And this is wonderful because when you build robots you want to make sure that when someone homes it upside down and it pile drives the floor, which any of you in experimental robotics? Yeah, you're all going to pile drive that Puma wrist. <laughs> I went in there late night, I don't know, whenever I took it three years ago or something and someone had calibrated it upside down and I turned it on and it thought that up was down and it went woo! And they, they've bolted it with just an inch so they can pile drive itself with an inch. Just an inch and a half more and it wouldn't happen. At any rate, people will abuse your robots, including you. And so if you use friction drives, they just slip and nothing breaks. If you use gears, then you shear teeth, cables, you uncable belts, you rip teeth. Uh, they are also extremely easy to assemble. So, um, and here's the reason why. Let's say this shaft, and when I say fixed here, I'm just going to make it like a little triangle symbol. This is not moving. The shaft is fixed. What do you think I have to do here to make a friction drive? I have to apply force that way. So there are two ways of doing it. Remember that slot technique we saw for tensioning belts last time? We can put a slot here and then we can move it that way. Now why do I have the slot on the other side too? It's just the, the tolerance is on. Exactly. Maybe my rollerblade wheels aren't, maybe they're a little bigger than I was expecting. If I said that this is, I think these are 80 millimeters and this is actually 82 millimeters and I ended my slot right here and I can't go bigger then it's going to be too squishy and it's not going to work. Always put your slots in the always put your shaft in the middle of the slots so you can do small components or larger components. Now there's another way I could do this. Say this is a big wheel and uh, this is actually a perfect time to talk about this. There are two main uh, areas in which you'll use a uh, friction drive. Tell me what they are. I'll give you a hint. In one of them, it's actuation. It's transferring power to move, you know, big forces and, and uh, big masses. What's the other one? Hmm? Nope. Sensing. So we can either use these for actuation. Now, I'm using these terms roughly, right? If you're moving something, even if it's sensing, it's actuation. But we'll, we'll call this AKA power transfer. An example will be, uh, this is um, a robot wrist and gripper I built a while back and I want to be able to turn doorknobs 
and those are pretty big motions and pretty big forces, so it's a lot of power. So these uh, roll bed wheels are transferring lots of power. So that's one category. And then the other is sensing. So say I want to sense the rotation of this wheel. What I can do is I can put a little wheel here. Okay. And then I'll put it on a bar. Anyone know what this symbol is other than a resistor? It's a spring. So this is the wheel I want to sense. This is a little, uh, a, a tiny version of your roll blade wheel. It's on a bar here, so we can swing down like this. And I have a spring that keeps it with a preload. Now, this doesn't have to be a strong preload. How strong does it have to be? Just enough so it doesn't slip, which is not a whole lot. So this is for sensing. This is a perfect version. And I would call this rotary loading or rotary preloading. And I would call this linear preloading. Why, uh, take your two roller blade wheels and rub them against each other until they don't slip. And you see when you rotate one, the other rotates. Okay. Why isn't the linear preloading good for sensing? Uh, it is. The difference is that I have to bolt something down here. So with the linear thing, usually you'll have like a, a screw and a nut here. And you'll, you'll loosen the screw and the nut, you'll push this one into that one, and then you'll tighten the screw and the nut. This one you just have a spring. It doesn't need to be very much. Like you really have to set the pretension here very, very precisely so that you get the power transfer you want. Here, you just need enough so it doesn't slip. And um, the other nice thing is here. Let's 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 uh, exaggerate for a second. Let's put little asperities here. So, say there's crap on your wheel. Okay, this will just ride up and down on it. Now, you're, it's screwing up your measurements, but actually not much because you're looking at the ratio of this diameter to this diameter and these little micro asperities aren't changing all that much. You could just sense directly here, but it's a trade-off between sometimes you can put an encoder directly on this shaft and sometimes you can't. Uh -huh. Question. Um, doesn't this type of drive kind of wear down on like, the material like, as you use it? It depends. If you have high loads, then quite possibly yes. It also depends on the material selection. So we're going to get back to that in a sec. It also depends on whether or not you properly housed your robot to keep stuff out. Uh huh. If you need the shafts in the, the linear preloading case, if uh -huh. you needed the shafts to be precisely located for both of them, mm -hmm. then would, I guess, the friction drive not be a good choice? Let's see. So Oh, so you need this one right here and this one right here? Yeah. Um, possibly not. Probably not, actually. But you have to, it depends on your material, right? The stiffer the material, the less um, deflection it requires. And so say the, those two aluminum, uh, those two rail blade wheels are made of aluminum. For, for the same, uh, for the same preloading, you need much less deflection. And so these shafts can actually be, I mean, you're talking down at thousands of an inch. Okay, so they're mechanically safe. Also, because we're sliding around, the tolerances can be somewhat lower in terms of, of the wheels, as long as they're matched. Be and that is because the, the gear teeth have to be spaced very precisely so that they don't either have too much backlash or they interfere. They, they, cut, they just, um, the teeth basically start eating each other. This one, you just squish until they're a good amount of force and you're done. So they're really easy to assemble. They're really easy to fix, but you never really have to fix them because they don't, they don't break catastrophically. Um, now, if they do slip, you do need to be able to detect it. 
and you need to be able to rehome. An excellent way of doing that is a 3D accelerometer. So if I put, you know, say there's a link here, and then I put a little 3D accelerometer there, and I know where gravity is, if I can detect the transient of the uh, characteristic of slipping, or I can put relative encoders and see when they start slipping, I can basically stop the robot, rehome, and then start up again. So there is the issue of you're, you, you may slip, but uh, you, you have to detect it, but it's not that hard to detect it. So one of the main disadvantages of friction drives is what? It's friction. Yeah, so if you're building a haptic device where you want really little forces and the friction is higher than the little forces that you want to be feeling, that could be problematic, right? Turns out you can build friction drives into haptics and have it work beautifully. I'll give you an example later. But uh, again, that goes back to material properties and we're going to talk about that, but that is the downside, is friction. And the other thing is it really loads your ball bearings. Wicked nasty. So. These forces are all internal, pointing at the shafts, right? When you squish them together, I'm going to push on my bearings back and forth. So you need to make sure that your bearings are spaced far apart, that they're big, they can handle the radial loads. Um, with gears, the bearing loads are way, way smaller. Mm -hmm. Is there a backlash? No, there's not. Well, it depends. So, and that, that goes back to material. Uh, but for, for practical purposes, if you're doing it right, no. There's little to no backlash. And that's one of the reasons why friction drives are beautiful. You're getting no backlash. It's easy to assemble and machine. It's mechanically safe. Um, OK. So now I hate to do this to you. But for us to get through the lecture, we're going to just, does everyone clear on everything I just said here? We're good on how, yep. Sorry, could you just explain the sensing Yeah, so this is a little arm here. I am now that. This is free to rotate on bearings, right? And I've got an, an encoder on here sensing that. And now I have my arm on a little pivot, so it's like that. So you're sensing if you're rotating? Yeah, I'm sen no, I'm sensing this, this rotation here. Mm -hmm. The only reason I have this is I'm going to put a string here. Um, okay, so this is a spring, and I'm pulling myself down on top of this wheel. Okay, I could use a bigger wheel, and the same mechanism works. I could use a smaller wheel, and the same mechanism works. As this spins, my little rollerblade wheel spins. Everybody see that? So by sensing this rotation, as long as nothing's slipping, which it shouldn't be, then I'm sensing this rotation. Now, it, at, at first glance, you may say, why don't you just put an encoder on here? What if this is a one meter diameter uh, shaft? What if this is a giant table the size of, with the diameter the size of this room? You're not going to put an encoder directly on that, right? They don't sell them, they don't make them. But they do make encoders for this size, so I could put this on the side of my, you know, 30 foot diameter wheel and still measure it precisely. What are you measuring? of the, the rotation. So this turns 30 degrees, this turns, I don't know, 300 degrees. And actually in that example with the gigantic room-sized wheel, we'll get, we'll get back this in future uh, weeks with encoders. Does anyone know about uh, the count, count per revolution on encoders? Okay. You can't get super ridiculously high uh, a resolution on encoders without paying through the nose. So if I have a big wheel here and a little wheel here, and for the same amount of money, I'm going to get the same encoder resolution, would I want to put it here or here on the little one? On the little one, assuming no slippage and no backlash, whatever this gear ratio is, I get that times more re uh, resolution. I have a, one question. Uh -huh. Is there a way to make a non backdrivable friction drive? Yes. <laughs> You make, um, you make the slipping force between these, as in the torque I have to apply before it just slips. Mm -hmm. You set that above the back drive torque. So as in, if, it's, not a, it's not a question of whether or not the friction drive 
back drives. It will. It's a question of does your mechanism back drive due to the gear ratios and the friction and the inertia in the motor. If the motor's back drive, then the only question is do I want to set this below or above the um, back drive torque for that motor. And so this is one of, this is a beautiful thing. Remember uh, back when I gave you three gear motors and one of them didn't back drive at all? And I said, don't push too hard or you'll shear all the teeth off. Remember, the last gear is the highest tooth loading and you'll just rip them right off, which I've done. You put a friction drive as the last thing before the motor shaft. And you set that slip torque such that it slips before the motor, uh, ge uh, the gear teeth shear. It's a fuse. Friction drives are a wonderful, cheap, simple, mechanical fuse because this slips safely and doesn't break and my $3,000 motor is protected. Is that seen a lot in practice? Yes. When, when you buy a, t a little toy robot arm at Walmart, they have uh, little friction slip plates everywhere because otherwise kids would break it you know, on day one and they wouldn't have any more sales. Sure. This, the friction drive isn't really affecting the back drive ability that much. It's, it's your, your gear ratio on your motor. If you have a, uh, a gear motor that is not back drivable, then it's not back drivable irrespective of a friction drive. If it is back drivable, it will still back drive even with a friction drive. What you want to decide is basically whatever the back, if you want to be able to back drive it, great. Make sure this won't slip when you start back driving it. So say I have a lever and I have to push with 10 pounds that way to get it to back drive. Then I need to make sure that this is spec for that load so it won't slip. It needs to slip at forces higher than what I'm pushing at to back drive it. Yeah, there, there is a little bit of rolling friction, just like driving with a flat tire and squishing and doing work on the material. Mm -hmm. So you want really hard wheels if you want to have very efficient transmission. Yep. And we'll talk about that in just a tiny bit. Also, instead of the encoder, can you just apply like power and then you just know how many revolutions you get just by how many seconds or how many volts you applied? No, that's called open loop. Uh, the only time we do open loop is for steppers. There's a special case. We're going to talk about that in a few weeks. But most of the time, even with open loop stuff, you need a sensor at the end in case something slips. Even if you have an open loop system like a stepper that's very precise, if somebody kicks your robot and it starts spinning around, you want to figure out when it comes back awake where it is. So open loop is generally not desirable. There are also a lot of control issues and stability issues. Okay, we're going to move ahead to differentials. Does anyone know what a differential is in terms of like a car? It's the outside wheel turning faster. Can we have a show of hands? Just so I know what we're dealing with. Differentials on a car. Actually, not that many people. Okay. So on your car, there's something called a differential. It's the thing that looks kind of like uh, were a car an animal, a male animal, it would be the part that you don't want to catch people staring at. That's what it looks like under the car. There's a, there's a, anyone know who Gary Larson is, the cartoonist? Very early, he does the far side, very early in his career, he made a cartoon with a dog on top of the underside of a car, and it said what a car, what a dog would do if it finally caught it, and he didn't, he didn't understand he drew it, so they were connotations, and he almost killed his career, because they, they had like family associations writing in thinking he was dirty, and he's like, oh, it does look like that. <laughs> Okay, so this is a differential. So inside there you see the kind of cream colored gears, bevel gears. Those are, sorry, those are cream colored bevel gears. These are two wheels and the, um, the dark gray thing is the casing of the differential. Okay. Now see how there are gear teeth on the casing? This is Legos by the way, this is why you should all be buying Legos for Christmas. So the gear, the gear casing, the differential casing is the gray thing, and the little bevel gears. Now watch this. In cars, the reason why they use these is they have this really cool, God, I hate this Kinemac inversion. It's terrible. Okay, is that better? Um, if you, the reason why this is cool is if I drive this casing, if I rotate this gray casing with my fingers, the wheels move forward, okay? Great. 
Now, look how I'm holding one of these wheels still, okay? And the other one's moving. Now I'm going to switch. I'm going to hold this, the other wheel st still, and I'm going to drive the casing, and the other wheel moves. So what does this mean? It means that if I start rotating this casing, either wheel can stop. Either wheel can actually go backwards, although that's usually a bad sign in your car. Um, and the other wheel compensates. So a differential is a way of basically splitting power between two rotating shafts. And this is cool because when you drive and you turn, okay, if these are my two wheel tracks and this is what ran in front of your car, going straight, these are the same velocities, right? And now, when I curve this way, this velocity is higher than this one. Everybody see that? And then I curve this way, and now the other wheel is higher. So on this one, it's the right wheel, and on this one, it's the left wheel. And then this one goes slower, right? because these are different arc lengths, the different radii, and so inherently, th for this thing not to be skidding, this one has to be slower and this one has to be faster. So the differential is what does that automatically. So what happens on a car differential is you input to the casing, and actually I'm going to drag this over here. In a differential, this is the casing, and this is what you're driving. And these are the two shafts going to either wheel on your car. Okay? This can be, you can grab it and not let it move and this will compensate. You can grab this and not let it move and this will compensate. You can even drive one of them backwards. So as your car, what's happening is as you're spinning this casing in your car and you're going straight, both of them are at the same velocity. And then as we curve, one of them is going to slow down, the other is going to speed up. You're not going to believe this until you get one in your hands. So what I'm going to do is pass these out. Anyone know what these are in? RC cars. They have amazing little mechanical widgets built for RC helicopters and cars. So pass these around and try grabbing the casing and spinning one shaft and grabbing the casing and spinning the other shaft. Drive the casing. Okay, so let's say this wheel is spinning at, I have a dead marker, it's a squib. Say this one's moving, I have a, sec a second one. Hey, right, anyone do you, you want to double down on the third one? Cool. Can you all see this color? Okay, and then this is the casing. And the casing is going to spin at phi dot. The way this works is phi dot is theta 1 dot plus theta 2 dot over 2. So this is constant. For some given RPM, we're, we're just spinning the casing at a, a constant velocity. And so what happens is we can make this zero, and all the velocity goes to the second wheel, or we can make to zero, and all of it will go to uh, the other wheel. But that's the basic, and this is assuming uh, one to one ratios on those bevel gears. So this is one to one ratio only. Actually, no, 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 it's not. That works. Okay. Yeah, this, this is this is good. But I just said erase that from your mind. Flashy thing yourself. Okay. Does everyone see how this works? Now imagine for a second, looking at this picture, in a car, we're driving the casing, and by the way, I understand this is complicated, it literally took me like two weeks in high school to like stare at this thing and figure it out, which I think makes me dumb, but 
So you rotate the casing and the car, and then we're interested in the motion of the shafts. We can reverse this. We could control the motion of these two shafts and only get the desired motion of the casing. Okay? Let's look at this third gear here. Do you think they'd be upset if I marked you? Probably. Okay. <laughs> that third gear. So in this case, this is a friction differential. Okay? So the ones you guys have have gears inside them. They don't have to be gears. They could be friction differentials. It could be with cables, the wham arm. Anyone heard of the wham arm? Okay. The wham arm uses a cables. And that's, that's another interesting discussion for another week. This is a friction differential. And so if you look at this, Everyone see this all right? Okay, so these are my two wheels. This is my a third wheel, and then this is a little casing in between. And watch what happens. I'm going to rotate one wheel. You see how the other wheel is rotating? So one would, you'd hold it like, ah, you'd hold it like this. If you move both wheels, it rotates like that. If you rotate the wheels in an opposite direction, uh, it goes like this. It spins. I'm going to try with Legos. Maybe the Legos will work a little better. Okay. When I rotate both shafts, the casing moves forward, right? See that? There's no spin of any gear. Not a single gear spinning. Now I'm going to reverse direction on, the, on this. And that's really difficult to see. Damn it. You see how that the gears are now spinning? Uh-huh. Can you explain how the gears are mounted to that casing? Yeah, they're able to rotate. Okay. So this is it's gonna be one of these things where it's it's just hard to see. So I'm gonna uh tell you what, let let me hold up this example. Rob, can you zoom in on this please? I guess I'll try the best I can with this from this distance. This is a friction differential. In this case, we're doing the opposite of the car. In this case, we're controlling both of the inputs, and we're trying to control the output of the casing, specifically that third gear within the casing. So I'm going to turn this on. The reason why it's going to give a little bit of weird motion is just voltages, etc. When I hold both of them down, God, I didn't quite get it. Can someone, Shri, can you hold this up for me, please? You can be my helper. Hold this up. Okay, don't want to let it drop. So, when I turn b uh, both in the same direction, it does that, okay? See? I'll call that pitch. That's both wheels on simultaneously. Now I'm going to turn them in opposite directions, same speed. The reason why it's doing a little bit of pitch is because the belts are different tensions and the, the voltages are different. But let me show you the main motion again. Both on at the same time, pitch forward, okay? And then in opposite directions, roll. Okay? Pitch. Oh, sorry, sorry. You okay? You okay? Sorry. Oh, God. Our first casualty. And it's on camera. What do you want? <laughs> if it's money, I have none. <laughs> okay, so that's pitch, same direction, and then the, uh, this is roll. Okay? This is lab two, except for that. <laughs> so all you guys are doing for lab two, and these won't be motors, they'll just be shafts. We're going to go from two shafts, through belts, to uh, roller blade wheels, to differential. So a couple things about this. Again, we're reversing from the car. We're controlling the input shafts and we're trying to control the casing velocity. Specifically, we, we don't care just about the casing uh, in... Now that you've seen that, did that hopefully clear things up a tiny bit? Okay. Uh, so I've been working on this figure. Uh -huh. Aren't they supposed to be opposite? Like Opposite. The, the two little arrows on the two shafts. Like if they rotate in opposite directions, right? I can't vouch for the figure. This is Wikipedia. Okay. 
So if I grab both of these shafts and I spin at the same time, this gear and this yeah. casing both do this. Yeah. This gear and this casing both do this. If I spin these in opposite directions, the casing doesn't move at all. Yeah. But this bevel gear starts spinning in place. Right. So now what we're doing here is basically this gripper is bolted onto this bevel gear over here. Right here. Okay? It's in a weird way it is, trust me. So when we spin together, the gripper comes up like this. When we spin in opposite directions, this wheel, this bevel gear, which is rigidly mounted to the gripper, spins the gripper in place. Uh huh. Question. So in that particular figure, the red and the purple are can move independently, right? I'm colorblind. Oh, okay. The two left. This purple. The the two two these? Yeah, these two can move independently. Okay. And then, but the um, the larger box is rigidly mounted to, I guess, where it's mounted to the. Yeah. So let's show. Box. See how this is purple? Uh, yeah. You're purple. That means, w this looks great to me, when you rotate the casing, it rotates this bevel gear like that. Let's, let's call, this is the bevel gear, okay? Right now it's like this. When I spin them both at the same time, this gear doesn't rotate about its axis, it gets lifted up like this, okay? Now when I spin them in opposite directions, it, does, it holds the pitch and it starts spinning about its axis. Everybody see that? I know it, it, it'll make more sense over the rest of the lecture, hopefully. Okay, so that's a differential. And we talked about friction drives. Now let's put them together and the sparks really fly. So uh, anyone heard, uh, what, what's the most common configuration for a robot wrist? No. That is a good configuration for a robot wrist, but it's also difficult to build. Roll pitch roll. Yeah. So uh, your, your own human wrist is roll pitch, y'all. And um, a robot wrist often is, um, from, from the elbow, is roll, pitch, and then at some weird angle, roll. So what this means is it's a singularity, and that's bad, but it's also cheap and easy to make, and that's why everyone does it. So say my pitch axis is right here, and instantaneously, instantaneously I want to go that way. Can I? No, it's a singularity. First I have to rotate, and now I can go that way. And if you don't code it smartly, you crunch your gears. So just so you know, the reason why, why this one here is roll pitch is because it's cheap. And we had another roll here. So this would be a roll, pitch, roll, uh, wrist. So to show you, say we could take this entire thing and spin it. Then that's roll. And then we have pitch. And then finally we have roll. And if you're wondering why it's so difficult to back drive, it's because the motors are on. But uh, so again, let's put this in a weird configuration. Roll, pitch. And then whatever that new axis is, that's roll. And so to show you that example, say I want to instantaneously move that direction. Can I? No. First, I have to roll. Okay. First, and this thing is... Uh, you could. Depends on your coordinate frame too, but basically when you're when you're aligning these, there's a singularity and that's bad. And the roll pitch y'all gets around that. We do this because it's cheap. And the reason, so okay, why did I tell you this? Let's go backwards. You're building a robot arm. It needs a wrist, and you'd like to do it simply and cheaply. So you're going to do roll pitch roll. If you're doing roll pitch roll, the simplest way to do that is a differential. This is a differential that's giving us roll, pitch, roll, if we rolled the entire arm. If you're going to do a robot wrist, roll, pitch, roll, with a differential, a friction differential is a safe, cheap way of doing it. Safe because if your robot smacks into the table, it just bends the wrist back, and it's fine, you just reset it. Otherwise, you crunch it. 
You guys in the experimental box with the Puma, has Khatib given you the spiel about not breaking the wrists? Yeah, I think my year we had like three wrists broken because there are gears and when you smack gears, they break. If the Puma had these instead, we, they wouldn't have to fix them all the time. Um, so you don't have to do a differential to do a roll pitch roll wrist. But can anyone tell me what a nice property of it is? Think about the axes of the roll and the pitch. They're perpendicular, so you can use them to preload. Well, yeah, that's actually true, but that's not what I'm looking for. They intersect at a point, and that's very nice because often in robotics we don't talk about the tip of your fingers; we talk about the tip of your or the center of your wrist, right? Well, if you don't have a center of your wrist, that makes your math kind of irritating. So a differential gives us intersecting roll pitch axes, which makes the math a bit easier. And we'll get to this in the cable lecture. It also makes the mechanics of it a lot easier. Then you can go to every coordinate. No. But you can. Mm -hmm. It's all trade-offs. Uh, okay, so let, now let's talk about how we build these and what matters. What do you guys think is the most important thing about these little wheels I got? The material. That's one of them. So let's look at material. This is probably the only time you guys are ever going to see PowerPoint in this class. I'm very sorry, but... Um, I already made this, so you're kind of stuck. <laughs> and how do I? Can anyone tell me when I'm on the like little button? Oh no! I have to go through the entire thing. That's terrible. Am I what? I can if you'd like. Sure. <laughs> Okay, let's talk about the material for a second. Okay, there are two material parameters or pairs of parameters that matter. They are friction between the two drive materials and the loss coefficient. When you take a piece of material and you load it cyclically or sinusoidally over and over, there's something called elastic hysteresis and you lose energy in that. So imagine you take those two wheels and I push them up against each other and I'm going to pick this point here and I'm going to rotate that direction. Unloaded, loaded, unloaded. So this is L for loaded, unloaded, unloaded. So if you were listening to this, it'd be like dunk, 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 over and over. So this is um this is your force and this is time. And we're going from unloaded to loaded over and over. So you lose some energy in that compression and decompression. The amount of energy you lose depends completely on the material. And it's actually called eta. It's the material's loss coefficient. Lower etas mean less energy lost to elastic hysteresis. So now let's look at these materials for a second. So this is plotting Young's modulus versus eta. I don't care about Young's modulus right now, but I had to pick something. So these are foams up here with high eta, which means what? High loss. This is rubbers and polymers, plastics in here. This is metals over here. This is ceramics. So the, the, if I were going to make a friction drive, and the only thing I cared about was the drive efficiency, what material would I pick? Okay. And if I wanted to have the worst possible efficiency, what material would I pick? Neoprene. Yeah. This, this is why people always talk about increasing the pressure and inflating your tires in terms of fuel efficiency. It's similar, not quite. So um, let's remember this for a sec. People hate machining ceramics. 
So we'd like the lowest we can that's machinable. So this is glass and ceramics. And then we get over here, these two circles are aluminum and steel. These are the lowest ADA that are actually easily machinable out of materials that you can buy in McMaster. Okay. Now remember what I said about pairs of, fric of friction coefficients? Compared to other materials that we interact with on a daily basis, how high do you think the friction is between those two wheels? Pretty low? Pretty, low? Pretty, high. Pretty high. So rubbers, and I'll include here urethanes, these are all very loose terms. For instance, I think no one's been able to tell me the difference between polyurethane and urethane other than that one of them is longer. So this, these are very high mu usually between anything, as long as it's not lubricated. So rubber on steel, rubber on aluminum, rubber on rubber. They're very high. But here, from the loss coefficient, we know we would actually like a metal. The metals on metals don't have particularly good friction properties, except for what? Anybody know? This is sort of just weird. Aluminum on aluminum has the highest mu of any metal combination. So if you were to pick aluminum and steel, it would not be very good. Bronze and steel, not very good. But when you do aluminum with aluminum, it has extremely high friction properties. So what's this mean? If we were to build a friction differential, what material would we want and why? We would want aluminum on aluminum. Uh huh. Does aluminum deform easily compared to other types of like metal? Sure, it does. Um, it, it has disadvantages. Some of them you can deal with perhaps by anodizing it. But uh, my reason, and I'll show you in a sec the haptic device I built with this. If you're doing a friction differential and you want you want high efficiency then you pick aluminum, aluminum because of the metals it gives you the highest friction coefficient and also aluminum gives you the lowest energy loss due to elastic hysteresis that you can get for easily machinable and obtainable materials. So you get awesome eta and awesome mu. It's terrific. So that's, that's material. Uh huh. So the, so this new thing, I mean, even if the gears are really slippery, I don't see how it, the energy gets lost. I mean, because you're squishing it and unsquishing it. When you, that's for uh, the hysteresis, that's when you're squishing. But for, uh -huh. the, for the for the for the mu, I mean, even if they're like oiled and super slippery, I don't understand how that loses. No, no, no. Uh, the friction is not talking about our drive efficiency. Okay. That has to do with. Okay, good. Why do we care about the friction coefficient? Anybody? Yeah. So, remember our equation was friction F equals mu in. And what is what does in do in our friction differential? So let me draw it out for you uh, here. Actually, let let me bring you to another picture real quick. Okay, so this, this is the next slide anyway. I'm going to call these the drive wheels and this is the driven wheel, the top one. Okay, now this is a little rubber spring that I use to set the preload between the, this plate and these two wheels. And it's the same thing here. I, this, the robot wrist is the exact same design. It's going to slip here and here, right? Those are the contact points. So if I, want, if I want to lift a brick with this robot wrist, then I need for this to not slip. And I have a choice. I can either do high mu or I can do a high in. Well, this is just material selection. If I choose my material smartly, I get high mu and high torque transfer for free. If I use a low mu for no good reason, then what do I have to do to in? Okay, I have to increase it. Now these wheels are supported on what? Ball bearings. Then I have to get nicer 
and larger ball bearings so that they don't go crunch under this gigantic normal force. So what I'm saying is the starting thing for a friction differential is what material is it going to be. We want to choose something that's cheap, easily machined, it's not exotic, not beryllium, and I'm going and then I want to get the best mu I can so that I can have smaller, cheaper bearings and I also want to have it as efficient as possible so that all of my mechanical energy isn't being lost. When you do aluminum aluminum, you get both of those for free. It's easily machinable, it's cheap, you can anodize it, you can color it hot pink if you want. Yep. Um, if, if the efficiency wasn't as much of an issue, but having a really high force was, would you then go to rubber? Or? Boom, right there, rollerblade wheels with those little 608ZZ bearings. Awesome. That's why we're doing rollerblade. Uh-huh. Aluminum, someone said aluminum is like a soft metal? Not really. It's not. Okay. It's kind of in between. A soft metal would be more like a bronze. You could even do pewter. You know those little figurines for Dungeons and Dragons that are pewter? You could have pewter friction differentials. That would suck, but you could do it. You'd have a lot more people in robotics. <laughs> uh huh? So does this, this aluminum aluminum issue mean that you shouldn't have gears that are both aluminum? That's an excellent point. Um, I don't actually know. I've seen aluminum gears. It's a really good question, and I don't have a good answer for it. Okay. Yeah. With gears, you usually you use separate metals. You wouldn't mention aluminum aluminum because of a phenomenon called adhesive wear. Okay. Like metals don't know which which object they belong to as they match. Solid state diffusion. So you get these little balls and the, the lifespan of of gears that are the same metal. That's why you'll see uh, iron and steel shears, and then brass and plastic or brass and stainless. Excellent answer. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and tell you the next important thing is wheel shape. There are three basic shapes that come to mind, right? If you're thinking about a wheel, we could have it round, we could have it sharp like a pizza cutter, or we could have it flat. Flat's the simplest when you think about it, right? Like if we were to laser cut this, it, it would all be flat. I'm just going to give you the punchline. Flat and sharp both suck. Round is the only mathematical way to go. Other than sharp, which will cut it in half because it's a pizza cutter. If they make this shape for a pizza cutter, you probably don't want it in your mechanism because it's going to cut your mechanism. So really, the only two practical options are round and flat. So let's talk about that. This is the full math. Little d is the size of my drive wheels. Big D is the separation between them. I'm not going to take you through the derivation. This is what it is. I've highlighted here. What, what looks like the variables that really matter here? Were you solving for you? Uh, okay, yeah, sorry. So. We are looking at this, right? Uh, would you rather see this or the robot wrist? This? Okay. So, phi is pitch. It's this. Okay? Gamma is my yaw. Uh, my coordinate system for this talk were set up differently. We'll, we'll call this roll. It's this. When I turn them oppositely and it spins, it spins this plate. Can you guys see this plate spinning? Here. It's called an indexing mark, by the way. See how that spins? Notice I'm not pitching when I do that. I'm holding it perfectly still, and I'm rotating. This is this gamma right here, and that phi is the pitch. Okay? So let's go through the math. In, by the way, that's a gear ratio coming off of this belt. If I had a wee little pinion here going through that, then we'd add the in. So just forget about in for now. So let's try this. What we're going to do is motor 1 and motor 0, we're just going to um, make them equal or equal and opposite. So if they're equal, we'll just call it theta, then it's, two, it's theta plus theta is 2 theta over 2 is what? Theta. So I spin them both by 90 degrees, and what do you think is going to happen? 90 degrees. Theta minus theta is zero, so it should not spin. So for 
thetas both being equal, I should pitch 90 degrees with no spin. And that's what's happening. Now let's reverse them. Theta 1 is minus theta 0. So these sum to 0, so it should not pitch. And this is 2 minus a minus is a plus, so we get 2 theta over 2. So we should spin 90 degrees. So let me, let me index it. Okay, so I'm going to do plus or minus 90 degrees. See that? It's spinning perfectly without pitching. What happens if I hold this one still and I move just one of the wheels? Will I get pure motion in either axis? No. Look, I pitch and I roll. Anyone know what this type of motion is called? Coupled motion. It's uncoupled if I can spin one motor and get one pure axle axis. It's coupled if they're tied together. For those of us, uh, for those of you who don't want to do math, you probably want uncoupled things. It's really hard. There's so many beautiful mechanisms with coupled motion. Just do the math and you'll be fine. Okay, now, you see this ratio here? Little d over big D. The separation between the wheels and the actual wheel diameter. If those aren't precise, then when our motors spin, we have no clue where the wrist or our gripper is, right? These have to be rock solid precise. So now, let's go back here. These are flat profiles. And I'm going to zoom in here. So, oh, it, it is zoomed in. This is, the line, this is a line of contact here when they're flat. Everybody see that? Okay. Well, remember, we want to know this diameter and then this distance. But the distance has to be, be between two points in this case, right? The line of contact is here and here for these wheels. It's not rolling along that line. It's rolling one point along that line and everything else is slipping. So if this is the contact, some point is going to roll and everything else is going to slip. Let me draw it another way. Watch this. Okay. When you have rolling, the point of contact has to be the same velocity on both plates, right? And say they're one to one. Say this is a one to one gear ratio. That means this distance has to be the same as this distance, right? But I don't know where I'm contacting along this line. If I'm contacting here, it's a different radius from if I'm contacting here. If I'm contacting here, this is less than one. If I'm contacting here, it's more than one, and my gear ratio is all over the place. And the problem isn't just that it's not one-to-one, -one, it's that I have no way of determining what it is. Because I can't figure out where along this line the actual point of contact is. So what's the simplest, does everyone see why this is? Mathematically? You can't have this line rotating like that. It has to be a point. This is a different radius with respect to this axis than this is. The math doesn't work. One, some point along here is going to roll and everywhere else is going to slip. If you had a robot with this, you'd see basically two sides of a line and just streak marks where it's eating the rubber off. So does anyone know what the solution for this is? It's obvious, right? If we curve this, then there's only one possible point where it can be. And if we machine this properly, then all of the math works just fine. Yep? Uh, if that width is much smaller than the diameter of the wheel, uh -huh. then can, can it be done? No. The reason being, so excellent question, say we extended this, right? And now we have a big honking wheel. And the axis is down here. Okay? And what you're asking is if we make this really skinny, so the aspect ratio is different. Is that okay now? The answer is no. If the math doesn't work, 
your robot will not work. And this is one of the things that most drives me crazy about gearhead type personalities is that um, you, you can't build your way out of mathematical impossibility. This has to be one contact point of a constant velocity between the two wheels and nothing else works. So given that assumption, you have to build around it and curve it. Now, one could say, okay, but can we get close enough? Sure. So let's zoom in, shall we? Let's make it that thin, and now that thin, and now that thin. We're going back to the pizza cutter. I mean, what's to stop us from keeping a thick wheel and doing a trapezoid where this is flat, right? And if we keep shrinking that point over and over so that the round off is just epsilon, eventually we're going back to the pizza cutter and we're slicing. There's no point. Because if we round it, and there are, there are tools that exist, they're five bucks each, for doing nothing more than giving you a precise radius. It's a super simple, easy machining process. For no more trouble with machining, basically, we can have it mathematically correct and not do the pizza cutter on our wheel. Mm -hmm. and when you round it, though, and, you, and you're preloading the wheels, uh, the material is going to slightly deform. Slightly, yes. But you can't get around that regardless. Even if you had a line contact, a perfect mathematical line contact, when you squish it, now you have some type of surface patch like that. Having a, not, having a finite surface area of contact when you have a heavy preload is a fundamental limitation of the fact that your material can squish. Now, part of the reason why you're feeling more energy loss in your rubber wheels versus your aluminum wheels isn't just the elastic hysteresis of the cyclic loading and unloading. It's the fact that because it's softer for the same preload, we get a bigger patch here that isn't infinitely thin, and so then we have more material that's not rolling, it's sliding and it's scrubbing. So you, you are correct, you do have a finite surface area that forms when it should be mathematically infinitely small, and that is part of the energy loss you're feeling, but for aluminum it's very tiny. If, if you're deforming your aluminum enough that you can feel that or measure it, your bearings are dead, long gone. So. That's why we go with the rounded corners. And by the way, uh, there was an unnamed person who saw this design and tried it with flat ones and couldn't figure out for months why he kept getting coupled motion. It's because the math was all wrong. He didn't know where the contact point was. And so he drove the two motors at the same speed, but the, ratio, the diam diametral ra ratios were different. It, it really, that's a detail that really matters. Okay, so we've talked about friction differentials, about the material, about the wheel shape. Does anyone know uh, the time when it is okay to have a flat profile for a friction drive? Not a friction differential, but just a friction drive in general? Um, modify your answer a little bit. Huh? Like that? No, think about um, something you're building in lab one. Rack and pinion. This is a rack and pinion with no teeth. Okay? Then it's okay for it to be flat. Then you want it to be flat sometimes because depending on what material you're using, for aluminum, it doesn't really matter, but for rubber, you'll actually get a higher torque transfer because friction breaks down in surface. For rubbers, okay, this is weird, and I may be slightly off my rocker, but I believe after reading about it for a bit, materials like aluminum and steel, surface area doesn't matter for friction. For rubbers, it does, because you're starting to squish down into the point where the material, the micro asperities are actually interlocking. And if you keep going, you actually have increased van der Waals forces between the actual molecules and atoms. So if you're doing a rack and pinion friction drive system, you probably want to be flat if it's a rubber drive, because then you get higher torque transfer. And miraculously, when you go on McMaster and type in friction roller, they're all flat. So after yammering on for 20 minutes about never letting it be flat, I am now telling you for rack and pinion to make it flat. See that? It's a rubber drive wheel. It's a blue one. I can buy little thin ones with the hubs. 
they're the exact same thing as gears. They have bores and hubs and set screws and clamps, but they're coated in rubber. And for rack and pinion, flat's just fine. For differentials. The reason being that 90 degree turn. For a 90 degree turn like that, it's got to be rounded. For something flat like the rack and pinion, it's flat. Flat is mathematically correct and it's also desirable for rubber. Uh huh. Uh, can you have friction drives on like any like angle axis? Like, uh, yeah, you can. Stuff, stuff can get kind of funky. But, but yeah, you can. And the rounding will give you a non coupled motion, right? No. What? Rounding allows you to have a rolling motion instead of slipping and sliding. The non coupled is a kinematic thing, the way you're, you're setting up your axes, not, not the, the rounding po profile. This may, of all of the lectures, this may be one of the better ones to rewatch on YouTube because we're going over a lot quite, quite quickly. Okay, so why rollerblade wheels? Yeah, they're cheap. If, if for a robot, you use only materials meant to be in a robot, you will turn into me, and your dissertation will be like 80K, and your advisor, sorry Ken, will have to pay 80K, and that's terrible. <laughs> 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 if you were to use frick, uh, something found in the store that's cheap but works well, then it would save money. And this is important, particularly for products. The only thing from my perspective that matters, uh, there are two things. One, it has to meet your specs, as in don't use something because it's cheap that sucks and doesn't do what you need to do. It has to do the same thing. The only other thing is repeatability. If, if I'm laser cutting all this I, or machining it, I can make it whatever diameter I need. This could be an 80 millimeter or an 82 or an 82.9995. I don't care what it is as long as it's repeatable. If I buy 30 of these wheels, I need them to all be plus or minus some tolerance. A lot of materials you find are actually pretty good. I mean they injection mold a lot of the stuff or they CNC stuff, not these, but other things. They're actually pretty repeatable. So it's just something to keep in mind. If you go to a store and buy 10 of them and they're all completely different, don't use it. If you measure all of them and they're basically identical, it's fine to use. Okay, so we're going to move on. Uh, please everyone take out your Tic Tac boxes. Oh, one last thing, real quick, while you take out your Tic Tac boxes. You can't see it because there's a gripper here. Underneath there's a single bolt. Remember on that slide, This, this spring and that bolt, what does that bolt do? Sets the preload and it sets the slipping force, okay? So what matters is I can set for my individual application, if I want my robot wrist to carry a really heavy load of bricks without slipping, all I do is twist the bolt, increase the preload and the normal force, and so the friction co the, the normal force and the friction equation, and I can carry my bricks. Then if I don't want to carry bricks and I'm going to be, you know, pile driving into tables, I can back off on it so it only takes a little bit of force to back drive and then when I smack into things I don't break. Friction drives are cool because you can set where that mechanical fuse is. Okay, I'm going to turn, I'm going to turn this off. We're going to talk about flexors. If I missed something, I will come back to it another day. Oh, one last thing. This device here is my haptic device that I built for the haptics class and um, you can come and look at it after class. It has an aluminum aluminum friction differential and I managed to get a higher dynamic ratio out of that than they have for cable drive in the sensible Phantom Omni and typically that would be like whoa that's crazy because that shouldn't exist. If you do friction differentials well, you can even use them in haptic devices. There's, well, people get nervous because you hear the word friction and then that should in no way in shape be associated with hardware for haptics, right? But if you do it smartly, it can actually work. You need a high efficiency drive and aluminum aluminum does that. All right, take out your Tic Tac boxes and I need a Tic Tac box. And open them up and let's all enjoy a 
zesty, refreshing flavor. I'm going to get a whole mouthful here because I need them. Okay. Okay. Now that we've all enjoyed this, by the way, cherry are delicious. You, uh huh. Mm -hmm. How good are they? Pretty good. I got a pack of ABEX 7, which is the highest precision that they sell. A pack of 10 for, I don't know, like 5 bucks or 10 bucks. Anywhere between 50 cents and a dollar for the highest precision available. Like, way the hell better than the ones you're using for Lab 1. And cheaper. Each one, each bearing for Lab 1 is 3 bucks. Okay, now this Tic Tac box. I hope you always remember flexors when you see a Tic Tac box. Open the hinge. This is a, a bearing. Go ahead, close it and open it up. And close it and open it up. See that? What did I tell you bearings do? They allow you to move in a constrained fashion. So look at this. I'm not moving out of plane. My point of rotation is right there, and I'm able to rotate back and forth. How is this not a bearing, but a ball bearing is a bearing? It's not. They're the exact same thing, different flavors, just like orange and cherry and wintergreen. <laughs> Poor people who got wintergreen. A flexor is a type of bearing, and it is spelled... Think of flexing, flex, flexure. There are linear versions, there are revolute versions, and then there are sort of uh, kinematic mechanism versions, which we'll go over. There are three main types of materials for flexures. Stainless steel, polypropylene, and polyethylene. Now, I believe your Tic Tac boxes are polyethylene. It's typically more common for flexure. It's cheap. They injection mold both of these. Anyone know what that is? You take a, basically a nice uh, steel um, negative of this and you squirt liquid hot, uh, magma hot uh, plastic in and it hardens in the shape of the Tic Tac box. It's like the cheapest way to manufacture anything. So this is injection molded, really cheap. And then stainless steel, I'll call it SS. Everything that you see typically in commercial grade stuff is polyethylene. For the lab we're going to be poly, uh, laser cutting polypropylene because it cuts better. So let's talk, let's zoom in. If you look at your Tic Tac box, and actually I'm going to break out the microscope because I paid a lot for it and I really want to use it at some point this quarter. Well, you can, you can read the fine print for once. Okay. Does everybody see this? Look in the corner. So that white corner you're looking at is the corner of the Tic Tac box. The thick part, that's the thick part of the Tic Tac box. <laughs> <laughs> you see how it looks like there's almost a sharp edge there as it meets the red uh, label? That is the flexure part. So I don't want you to get confused and think that what a flexure is is basically, this is not your Tic Tac box, right? Is this your Tic Tac box? No. This would be a cantilevered beam, where we just bend the entire beam. The Tic Tac box does this. It gets thin here. This thin section here, that's the flexure. 
The reason it has to be thin is because then it, uh, so these, pl these plastics are pretty tear resistant. Here, don't do this, but I'll just. <laughs> it's a bad sample, it's fine. They, no they normally don't rip. They're, they're pretty resistant. <laughs> no one can see my internal forces. <laughs> um, they're, pre they're usually tear resistant except for that one example. You want this thin for two reasons. A, so it rotates with low, with, uh, low spring force. They're not that spring. You see, they open and close pretty easily. If this was cantilever beam, it wouldn't. And somewhere in here is your point of rotation. So let's zoom in. Your point of rotation is somewhere in here. The thinner this is, the more certain you are of where that center of rotation is. Right? It's going to rotate somewhere in the thin section. The thin you make it the more precisely located it is. Now, is this here a good design with the sharp corner? No, we shouldn't do that. And why? Stress concentration leads to cracks, leads to tearing, leads to the dark force. It's very bad. So we want this dimension here to be very thin so that we have a precise location. We want to curve it so that we don't have stress concentrations, which probably leads to tearing. And um, that's about it. Now the issue is, this still isn't that precise. I mean, it's plastic. Maybe the point's here, maybe it's here. So if you were doing, I don't know, a micro manipulator for um, decapitating flies, which they're actually doing downstairs, it's pretty cool research. <laughs> Yeah. You can't use roller blade bearings to do that. They're too big. You're going to need... They're doing both. It's the, it's the, the fly meets Marie Antoinette. So you're going to use flexors because they're small and you need small bearings. But you're doing precise micro manipulation, so you need to know where that revolution point is. When you use flexors and pairs, they tend to cancel each other out in terms of that imprecision. This is a robot gripper, as is this. And I'll zoom in here. Okay, see this? See that plastic there? Note a couple things. It's way thinner than the bars here or the base here. It's, it's much thinner and they're all rounded. And now I'll show you what that looks like. See how it bends? Now drawing this, actually let me just zoom out for a second. So let me get the marker and color this. I'm going to color the flexors for you, okay? They're in black now. <coughs> See that? Anyone know what the term for this mechanism is? No. It is a type of linkage. Keep going. Parallelogram. It's a parallelogram, which is a special type of four bar mechanism. So when I move each finger, See how these, these fingertips always remain parallel to each other? I can close them. I can move them. Now, the reason why I'm using flexors here is because they're cheap. And if you're mass producing robot grippers, it'd be nice for them to cheap. They're also extremely durable. This, I literally cannot rip. Of this thickness, and I've tried. I've literally taken a hammer and beaten it mercilessly. It won't rip. There are no ball bearings. There are fewer components. I've cycled it thousands of times. The reason why it's in pairs, other than that's what you do for a four bar linkage, is um, <coughs> if, the rota if the in ideality of where that point of rotation is, is the same in ideality for all of these, they tend to cancel each other out. You can imagine if you had two plates that started kind of, they're supposed to be flat and you mate them, okay? But now each of them is slightly bent 
and you bolt them together, they kind of do that and they straighten each other out. It's the same thing with these flexures. If you use a single flexure, the odds are it might not be that precise for what you're doing. You have to, you have to see. If you're using flexures in a kinematic linkage like this, the odds are they're actually extremely precise. And you can buy these things. There's a place called, uh, they're called C-Flex, C-Flex. They're also called Flex Pivots. They're competitors. And they sell little, very minuscule versions of these out of stainless steel. Okay, now let's compare these with ball bearings. Range of motion. Ball bearings spin infinitely, right? What about flexures? No. Flexures are for finite rotations. You can't get around that. If you need more than about 30 degrees, plus or minus, you're not going to get it. Don't use flexures. Ball bearings are fine, but you can't do with flexures. Um, no, that's why it's so precise. It's precise. If you have one flexure, you don't know where the point of rotation is. When you have pairs of flexures, particularly not just okay. If you if let's draw a kinematic linkage, shall we? So I want uh, this plate and this plate to be on a bearing. So I'm going to put a little flexure in between. This is not precise. Okay? And I'm going to make a serial linkage of these. Has anything changed? No. Because each one of them is imprecise. The entire indefactor here is imprecise. And in fact, it's even worse because then you have concatenated errors. What I'm talking about here is the following. The fact that I'm pairing these in parallel, that is what's helping get rid of that imprecision. If this one is here and this one's here, they cancel out. Even if this one's here, it still pretty much cancels out. You have to play with it to kind of feel it. How, how do you make them move in the first place? Uh, you squeeze on them, and I'm about to show you that. So I saw a hand up. Go ahead. Uh, you said they don't move more than 30 degrees. Yeah. So. Remember we talked about elastic deformations and plastic deformations briefly? Mm. Plastic deformations are those that when you move too far, they don't spring back. It's permanently bent. The paper clip is bent in half and it's not coming back. Elastic is you only moved a little and it's going to go back with no problems. Mm. So if you move these so far that you plastically deform them, then they don't work. You have to stay in the elastic range on these. Uh, and also, just look at the geometry on that, uh, or even on one of these. If we, let's zoom in right here, okay? This edge is going to hit this edge at some finite rotation. This is part of the finite limitation of flexures. But our tic-tac boxes, we can rotate around. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. OK, let's back up for a sec. Flexures have a finite uh, rotation period. Yeah. Tic-tac boxes are actually pretty high. They're you know, about 180. I'm about to show you something which is plus or minus 30. Let me hook this up real quick. Sorry about that. That was confusing. So that 30 degrees is not a rule of thumb or anything? No, only for one specific type of thing that I'm about to show you. So, sorry, officially, for the record, your TikTok maxes, that's about the limit. If you put it on the very edge, you could keep going. You could get 270 or something, but it's mathematically impossible for it to get 360, right? Everyone see that? So tic-tac boxes are really good examples. If you kept going, you probably just start ripping it. And the things I'm about to show you are even lower.
Do you know? Yes, please. And this time you can hold yes. anywhere along here. Cable. Just don't let the wires cross. So the effect of like a punch, the, the distance between the edges, like the yes. corners, mm -hmm. the width of the material? Yeah, we'll get to that. Oh, these are all unplugged. Damn it. You all wanted to see how to move them, so I figured I would move them. Okay, let's see. You zoomed in? Okay, so that opens it. That closes. Open, closed. Once you. Ooh. Did you laser cut those? Yeah. Here? Trippy! Oh, God, that's awesome. <laughs> Anybody know why? Just interestingly enough? Oh, sorry. Oh, God, my wires. <laughs> Okay, so the reason is, the reason why, thank you, the reason why I wanted, I have two fingers, the reason why I didn't just want open and close is this. I have an object. Parallel gripping is just what people do, okay? This, for this arm, it was something I was working on with Morgan Quigley in Andrew Ng's lab, uh, and basically, we just want to see, can we make the cheapest arm possible that works? So every design decision, if there's a bifurcation and there's a cheap one and an expensive option, we took the cheap one. And this is where we ended up. And so basically it ends up that making or buying a mechanical transmission that will reverse the direction of these fingers, as in this one moves left and this one moves right, this one moves right and this one moves left, together, is more expensive than simply buying two little gear motors from a hobby store. So like, okay, cool. And then what does that give us extra? The ability to do this. It's just an extra degree for him to play with. Okay, so those are flexures in, in, in one sense. Now I'm gonna show you something else going back to the microscope. Quick question about that. Uh-huh. Uh, so the motors are connected to what? To one of the two bars of each motor? Exactly. And I can, let me pull up this camera and I will zoom in on that. I'll take the wires off. Okay. What? <coughs> there. Oh. Our camera got disconnected. No matter. So the, um, yeah, you're exactly right. I have a motor directly rotating where there should be a flexure on one of them. Instead, it's a motor. So on, on this one, this is the motor right here. It spins that, and then all the others just follow it. Is that too harsh on that one? No, it's okay. And if you were to idealize this as a, some sort of linkage, do you draw like a point of rotation somewhere? Yeah, just at the center. So you have like four points of rotation? Four points of rotation. Mm -hmm. we'll, we'll go over the four bars another day. <coughs> okay, um, so let's go back to the microscope. No, let's go back to the other camera. Is it really 545? Okay. Okay, so that's booting up. Um, just a quick note. I'm going to pass this around. There are two sides of this, the one I've marked and the one I haven't. Uh, dude, seriously, come on. I'm going to switch back to the microscope because this one sucks. Okay, so this is one of the flexures. Is that pretty clear? Somebody tell me something obvious. Huh? There is a white mark. Can you tell me the term for that white mark? It's hilarious. What is it? Huh? Nah, I can't accept that. It's really similar. It's called crazing. 
It's not a rave dance. This is, a, this is a phenomenon in plastics. When you cycle plastics, they craze. <laughs> they, they turn white. I didn't have you do this with your TikTok box. Why? It's already white, so you won't be able to tell anything. Um, just an inf interesting tidbit. I don't know what this means practically in terms of your stuff. It, it means that you're doing something bad in terms of the deformations and the loads. So if you start crazing your plastic, you probably want to back off a little bit. But I've cycled this thousands of times with no problems. Um, you do want to worry about creep. Does anyone want <laughs> <laughs> So this is similar to crazies. And now we have creep. Anyone know what creep is? Can you start getting a crack? No. That. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if I were to take a plastic bar and ground it and just apply a load this way and just leave it for like a day, then when I came back in the morning, it would be somewhere here. Now that somewhere here is pretty small for most plastics, but it does happen. And so uh, were you to put Were you to lock a marker like this and then leave the motors on all night and assume you had thermally specced them so nothing will fry in terms of the motor heat, if we locked this with high force for a week, our flexors would kind of stretch. Just so you know, you need to, you probably won't worry that much about it, but now you know the term knowledge is power. Let's go back to the microscope. <coughs> Okay. And again, note that that's curved. You got to play with that ratio. The smaller it is, the easier it rotates. Imagine that it is infinitely thin. Then it won't. It, it you know it's like nothing's there. But then it rips in half easily. So it's a, it's sort of a you have to play with it to get the 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 sizing right. So it it's tear resistant enough, but it doesn't um, doesn't resist motion too much. What what? The, uh huh. Sorry, question. Yep. You know that flexion, you only moved in one direction. Do you have flexions that I guess are like two dimensional? No, no, this moves in both directions. Right now, these are straight up and down. Okay? And I can move the flexures this way. And then I can move them that way. Oh, no, but can you move it forward and backwards? Oh, this way? No. And in fact, um, I'm going to take this on the floor for a second and just... I have a hammer, don't I? Do I have a hammer? I don't have a hammer. I should have brought a hammer. Now, the only thing that happened... Some of these press fit bearings came out. But, you know, we're still good. Um, so let's see. Oh, yeah, yeah. I want to tell you about the trade-off. So, so we talked about wanting this to be as thin as possible, not only to locate this, this rotation right, but also to have it rotate smoothly. But then that makes it weak and then want to tear, right? So what's the logical thing to do? <coughs> we extrude it into or out of the board. So if we make this thinner, then we increase its distance um, in, in the board. Right? Like that. So imagine your tic tac box. Wouldn't your tic tac box be a lot more resistant to tearing if you made it twice as wide? So that's why these, fing these fingers aren't just. That's why these fingers aren't just uh, a, single, a single laser cut width. I stack them like this. Shruti's smiling. I broke the shit out of this. <laughs> <laughs> I was waiting for one of you to notice. It's sad. I think my theory is Rob came up here earlier and took a hacksaw and got it started for me. So we verified I can rip tic tac boxes, I can rip flex your fingers. The conclusion is that I am the Incredible Hulk. That's a very embarrassing. I have one question. Already. Yeah. So, are, are the, is this uh, a technology only for, for prototyping? Or for no. no. TikTok boxes is not for prototyping. 
Yeah. But what well, I'm about what I'm what to open and close this so many times. So true. <laughs> uh, also, don't my my mother eats one Tic Tac a week. <laughs> she gets them at Christmas and finishes them exactly on the next year. <laughs> I open it once and the box is done. I, what I'm about to show you uh, is used by NASA a lot, and it's a flexure. So let's let's zoom in here. Uh, I'm going to start by showing you the movie. Um, okay, this is from Riverhawk Flexural Pivots. So this is called a flex pivot. So see the two halves half one and half two are rotating with respect to each other. These are little stainless steel beams in between that they've wire EDM'd and it's rotating back and forth. Now see how I said around plus or minus something small? These actually behave best plus or minus 15 degrees. I have the versions that you can do plus or minus 30 but they're iffy. The fatigue life is terrible when you go up to plus or minus 30 degrees. So this is a single bearing. This is a skate bearing but it's only uh, the, the nice thing is, you know how for lab one, every time you guys have a bearing joint, you have not one but two bearings, and then you have at least two shims, and then you have, uh, let's see, then you have a Belleville washer, and you have two shaft collars? That's a crap ton of parts. If you used this instead, you would have one single part and you would be done. So what you do is you clamp one side here, on one side here, and that's it. So if you're installing one of these, and I'll show you in just a sec, if this is my flex, oh, that's right, that's the graveyard. If you're installing one of these things, this is what it looks like. Okay, so these are the two halves and they rotate independently of each other. See that? So you just grab here, you clamp on it, and then with the second plate you want to rotate, you clamp on it on this half and you're done. That's literally it. One single part. It's beautiful. Now the main limitations are finite rotations. These are around plus or minus 15 degrees. Um, they're expensive. I think they're like 35 bucks a pop. Um, but NASA uses them frequently. Because if you stay below the fatigue stress li limits, they have infinite life. And when you're sending something to Mars, mass matters, right? So you, and also the complexity in terms of you want fewer parts if you can. So there's less to go wrong with this. N nothing can get in here and then hurt the balls of your ball bearing. So like there's no shaft. It's no shaft. Yeah, it, they, you have to attach the material on the outside. Mm -hmm. Does, is that more complicated? No, it's actually simpler in, in, in some ways. Let's look at what, how we might clamp this. Let me erase this. By the way, I know it seems like I'm just making up for my superhuman strength, but um, I did take a rubber mount and just whack on that thing for like an hour when I first built it. It did survive. Um, it's just when you guys were watching. <laughs> so were we to clamp onto this, say we wanted two plates to rotate, we put a hole here. Okay, and then we do a side hole here. Okay, so one half of the flex pivot would stick right here. And then we'd put a screw here. And we could uh, we'd tap this. So this is as we uh, tighten the screw. This clamps on the outer diameter of our flex pivot here. And they uh, they sell these, and these are also extremely easy to make. So uh, and then you attach that to whatever. Yeah. So if we took two of these, so now you know. Let's uh, let's draw a second one here. Oh man, that looks terrible. So I'm going to dispense with the, the clamp part, but assume we had one here and then a second one here. Now we could, we could ground this and we have something that's able to wiggle. These things are freaking precise. 
this is basically as good as a ball bearing in terms of pre precision of locating the, um, the axis. So whereas the single laser cut pivot wasn't that precise, this is extremely concentric. Um, so someone, t oh, and then let me, so, okay. So that was, that's a little movie. And now I'm going to actually show you a real live one that we, they don't breed in captivity, but. And actually, all right. Well, no one sneeze or this thing's gonna be lost forever. Okay, so this is an eighth inch one. Do you guys know what the the smallest OD bearing ball bearing is that you can buy on McMaster or most bearing houses for an eighth inch shaft? Quarter inch, six point three five millimeters. And then you have the shaft collars and everything else. So you see the two halves here. If you wanted an eighth inch ball bearing um, joint instead of this, you'd have an eighth inch shaft and then you'd have a quarter inch bearing and you'd have flanges so then you'd be up more to around eight millimeters. You're probably looking at a minimum of an eight millimeter diameter for a three, roughly 3.175 millimeter joint whereas this is just 3.175 millimeters. Now let me turn it on its end. I see lots of heads nodding. Sorry, this is a. Uh, I saved the. Um, what are these called? Here? These are called flex pivots, or flexural bearings. You guys see the the crosses in between. So these are the structural beams that run back and forth. Now there are two. There there are two important things. One's a pro and one's a con, and I'll let you tell me which is which and why. Is anything rolling here? Is anything sliding? Is anything slipping? No. Which means what? Very low energy, low friction. There's zero friction. Wait, aren't the inner surfaces? No, they're gliding on each other. They're, they're not touching. Oh, okay. It's weird. I can't even start to explain this. If you're, int if you're interested in it, then Google um, flexural pivot or, fl or flexural bearing. And you can also try Riverhawk is one of the companies that makes these. The other company is C-Flex. And it took me like a good night of staring at these things and then ordering one and playing with it to really understand it. They don't touch. They're literally frictionless. However, This is my next example. So I have, that's just one of them. Now I've put two of them together. I've clamped them in some laser cut pieces. Okay, I'm gonna show you what it looks like for it to rotate. Can everyone see that? See that? That's the in stop. That's the other in stop. One in stop, two in stop. One in stop, two. And see how they're bending on the middle? But you see how there's a gap between the two uh, sort of uh, cylindrical sections? They're not touching. There's no friction. Now, let me zoom out on the other camera. I know the cameras are annoying, but there isn't much of a better way to show you tiny stuff. Okay, see these two? So this is a little arm. This is a little arm. And this is a little arm. The only thing that are here is the base plate here is on one, and then I press fit these little arms on the other, and that's it. Now, watch this. Someone tell me something obvious. It's, back to it's a spring on the other side. I can go this way and let go. I can go this way and let go. So, and this isn't just this product. This is flexors in general. I'll take the one finger that I didn't annihilate, and if I bend it this way and let go, see it slowly going back, and this way, 
and they go back. It always straightens itself somewhat. Flexures have some amount of springiness. It's inherent to it. You're bending the material. It's going to spring back at least part way, hopefully. That's both a good and a bad thing. These are frictionless. They'd be great in haptics, right? Because we no longer have bearing friction, but what's the problem? There's springs, so now we have spring forces in our haptic renderings, and that's terrible. So this is an example where springs are bad. But, say I had a version of, um, let me hold up the one that's not broken. So, in this case, these fingers are really difficult to back drive, just because of the gear head. That's just the backlash. The actual springiness you can't even feel because that spring force is so much smaller than the back drive ability that when I move it, I'm, I'm hoping, other than the backlash, well, maybe it's back driving a tiny bit. Yeah, okay, no, you can see it. See that springiness? Okay, now I'm remembering. This is the second prototype. The first one I built I had a much higher gear head, and the reason I, st I stopped using it is uh, it broke itself because it couldn't take the gear loading. The original version, you couldn't see any springiness at all because this little spring force was so much smaller than the back drive force. So in that case, it wouldn't have mattered at all, right? Who cares if there's a spring if you can't feel it? So this is just, this is one of those things where when you're talking to people, they'll already have preformed opinions about whether or not springiness in a, 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 a joint or a pivot or a bearing is good or bad, and they'll say one or the other, but that's not the case. Haptics, it would not be good to have springiness. Robot gripper, where you can't even feel the springiness, doesn't matter at all. Let me check the outline, see if there's anything we missed. I think we're at that time where you all turn into pumpkins. Um, what? That's it. So uh, if you have uh, office hours, 7 p.m., we'll hand out laser cut stuff. Hopefully we'll have enough. If not, uh, quick shout out. Willow Garage saved our asses last night. They let me come and use their laser cutter. So a quick round of applause for Willow Garage. We'll be, we'll be clapping at the end every week they let me laser cut until ours is fixed. 